know, so uh, she won't be here today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, we certainly wish her the very best. And the, the baby, um, they, I think y'all know it was potential for her to go to NICU. Maybe they don't have to go to NICU, but let's just keep our fingers crossed and prayers in line along those lines. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. And the uh, first thing will be uh, the short-term rental review and discussion. Mark, we're going to let you make some comments, and then we'll get started, Council. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of Council. Uh, you all were uh, present with uh, the rest of us last week for uh, the public hearing on this issue. Uh, you had uh, 55 speakers. Uh, I'm not going to try to summarize for you what 50, all 55 of them said. I will tell you that approximately 34 of those speakers were either from the Sandbridge area or spoke with respect to the issue as related to Sandbridge. Uh, the second biggest group that spoke before you were representatives of the Bay Lake Pines neighborhood. Uh, since the, uh, since the um, public hearing last week, uh, the House and Senate have agreed to the language of uh, uh, House Bill 824. That language now provides as follows, and I have passed it around at your desk. Any short-term rental located in the Sandbridge Special Service District in the City of Virginia Beach shall be a principal use subject to the City's regulations applicable to short-term rentals. Whether a short-term rental located in any other area of the City of Virginia Beach is a permitted use shall be determined by the provisions of the City's zoning ordinance. That bill was passed by an overwhelming majority of both the House and the Senate and is awaiting the Governor's signature. Um, the way I interpret that language, um, okay. uh, short-term rentals would become, based on this language, a principal use within the area that is otherwise defined by the geographical limitations of the Sandbridge SSD, but the council is left with the ability to determine what subordinate zoning regulations might affect that use in that area, and likewise, um, uh, what whether to allow this use as a principal use or a conditional use or a non-permitted use uh, elsewhere in the city. Um, on a flyer, I, I took um, some of the information that was, I think, used in part to generate the map that was provided to you by the commissioner. Um, and th these numbers, I, I think, change from minute to minute. But generally speaking, from the information we could glean, approximately all, uh, approximately half of all of the uh, short-term rentals that have been identified within the city are within the uh, the uh, the Sandbridge area, um, and um, about 13, almost 14 percent of them, located throughout the remainder of the city, would be within the uh, R5R zoning district. Another almost 10% would be in the uh, Oceanfront Resort Zoning District, and then um, another significant uh, amount of them, approximately 7%, would be um, within uh, our, our apartment zoning district. So if you, if you and, that, and that sort of correlates to the dots that you see down in Sandbridge, along the resort area, up along the north end, over to the Cape Henry area and then up to, to, to Chesapeake Beach. So uh, I don't know whether that's helpful to look at it that way or not. Another way to look at it is, is by council district. Uh, but that's basically the information we have. And I, I think this time should is better used by listening to you than having you listen any more to me. So I turn it over to you, Mr. Mayor. And I appreciate that. Okay, council, thoughts, please. Okay, since no one's speaking, I'll throw some thoughts out. And uh, But please, as I do this, I hope that you all understand that I, this should become a conversation within the whole body. And what I would say to you is I'm thinking out loud. You know, I, I would sit back and say to you that um, we are going to have, we've been dealt a hand that we've got to deal with, 
and uh, as far as dealing with Sandbridge. That has been regulated by the Commonwealth. That being said, there are other areas of the city that need to be dealt with. I, my opinion is this, and it's just my opinion. You know, we do have rentals at the north end of Virginia Beach. We have them in other areas of Virginia Beach, and they are short term. I think that the key thing is to make sure a short term rental is operated properly. In other words, it does not become a nuisance in the neighborhood. And the question comes about how do we prevent that from happening? I have said in every meeting that we've talked about, I believe it gets to good management. Um, and one of the things that we've always had as a part of uh, our uh, proposals, whether it was Sandbridge or whether it was uh, anywhere else in the city, is if there is a problem, the issue of having someone to respond that has control of that property through either contract with a management company or family member or something along those lines, to me, is absolutely critical that they can respond within that 30-minute time limit. And I hope that we will always keep that in place. Uh, Shannon, thank you for shaking your head. Uh, I really believe that that's absolutely critical. I believe that good management companies aggressively try to prevent things from occurring. However, are they perfect? No. But nonetheless, a good management company is to their benefit to make sure that the properties are managed properly. The Airbnb is my concern, most of all, in who is going to be the representative from Airbnb if there is an issue that comes about in a neighborhood. I understand there will be a personal representative, but I want to understand more how that would be. And that's just some of the things that have been on my mind, and I, I welcome others to agree, disagree, or have other ideas, Bobby. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, no question this is a very complex issue right now, and that's why we're dealing with it. But I think the bottom, one of the bottom lines that we have to think about going forward, you know, as I visit a lot of homes throughout the day, that a lot of people are dependent on income to help pay some of the bills that they're having. And, you know, a lot of the folks that have the short-term rentals are the Airbnb. And the thing is, I think, we, at least with the Airbnb, at least you have, you know, not, uh, some, a lot of times you're going to have the uh, people staying there. You know, they're well, be well let me jump family. in. I consider that two different things. Right. I consider that home sharing. Right. And home I believe sharing. everyone is comfortable yeah. as long as the person that's living there at the same time that they're renting out a room. Am I getting nods around the yeah, table on that? Okay. Yeah. I mean, so we got two right. different things there. Right. And But with the home sharing, no problem. We got to do that. But but by the same token, the question we got to ask, are there already laws on the books that are just maybe not being enforced right now that could be enforced, you know, that would help mitigate some of the, you know, these problems that we're having out there? But, but once again, you know, my, my concern, and I believe in the concern of the neighbors and everything and the safety and, you know, the quality of the neighborhoods. But once again, are we, you know, I, I just wouldn't want to inhibit some people that desperately might need some money to help offset, you know, some costs going forward. I'm just asking that we weigh that into our consideration. Right. Jim? Well, you know, as I've been thinking about this, I think probably one of the most important things that we do is make sure that neighborhoods are safe and, and that people have quiet enjoyment of, of their property. And I think that's where a lot of this started. A lot of this started because of event homes and, and, and things like that. Um, and I kind of still go back to the, um, the the three strikes and you're out over two years thing, which which really bothers me because I just I, I, I worry that that the police are going to come multiple times before somebody gets cited. And then once they're cited, it's going to go through the whole court process, and you know that that could take a year. And by that time. More, more stuff could happen. So I, th I think the, the issue that you're going to have there is that, that, that that's going to be a completely, not, not unenforceable, but a completely useless rule because I don't think it could ever be activated unless it's a, an extremely bad house. But, but, but you have to think about it. If, if you live next door to one of these, these homes, and, you know, I'm sure 99% of them are, are well managed, but if there's a problem 
right next door to you and you have to keep calling the police over and over and over. And we, we've seen the police chief comes here all the time and works on voluntary compliance, not writing as many tickets, trying to be proactive. Well, that doesn't help if you've got this issue that, that's moving forward. So I, I, I'm not comfortable with that language in any of these proposed um, regulations. I'd like to see that, that fleshed out a little bit better. Um, and that, that, that's really my concern because I think you brought this up uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I think council, I know I tend to agree with you, and I think the council tends to agree with you on that. I take, I take it another step, though. I think our desire is not to have to necessarily have police respond to some of these issues. A lot of it, we, I thought we were going to bring zoning people in. I know when we were meeting, go ahead, please. Yeah, but, but so... My concern isn't so much that somebody leaves their trash can out an extra day. My concern is people not being able to sleep at night. And, and so, I mean, I, the, the way I look at it is, is there's serious infractions and there's not so serious infractions. I mean, obviously we don't want trash cans left out for a week or something like that, but, but I'm, I'm more concerned about the fact that, that, that you know, there's, there's something going on and it needs to be stopped. Make sure and, they understand what's on it. Yeah, great. You asked for... If there could be an administrative yeah. way to look at it. Was that looked know. at at all? The, the three of violations language comes from the state statute that was passed last year. And I even talked to someone in Richmond who had a hand in drafting that, and I asked them, how do you interpret that? What exactly does that mean? And I didn't ever get... Well, I got a very candid admission that it wasn't very clear. Um, so I, I believe that it would allow revocation of the registration, but remember, the registration as provided for in that state code provision doesn't even apply to someone who operates through a brick-and-mortar uh, entity licensed through the state real estate um, um, with the state real estate license. So, so I, I'm not sure that, that that provision really gets you very far. What in practice is going to happen here, I think, is that the zoning enforcement is going to come in where there are repeated complaints, there are repeated problems, and then that zoning process is by definition a long process, but after there have been a certain number of complaints, then it's going to be incumbent upon the city to then go forward and seek an injunction against that owner to prohibit whatever the conduct is that keeps arising. And it will be that injunction if we can get the court to issue it, which is actually going to provide the protection. It's not going to be the removal from the registry, I don't believe, in practice. And it's not a speedy process, and I don't want to. I don't want to give the perception that it is, because you got to give a notice. You got to give a notice of violation. It, it, they have 10 days to to make it right. Then they have the right to appeal. There's a summons. It goes through the court process. But what I'm saying is, once that happens a certain number of times, and these will always be violations that are remedied before the 10 days is up. But once we have a sufficient number of uh, alleged violations that we can then go to the court and say this is sort of a problem that's repeating but escaping review we therefore need you to give us an injunction that's how i think that these kinds of repetitive problems end up getting resolved and i will ask my uh planning and zoning attorney or the zoning administrator to modify or amend or add to that response if they view it differently what will the injunction do? The injunction would be fact specific to what was going on and causing the problem. So if it's, you know, repeated re repeated noise late at night, if it's repeated parking violations, whatever it is, it would be tailored to that conduct. And the owner would be told, if you let this happen again, you know, and it comes before me again, and you're in violation of my order, then it gets enforced through contempt of the court. Kay, do you disagree? I mean, I'm sorry, Mr. Moss. I just no, no, no. You, you got a question for your staff. I don't want to get in the way of that. No, so I, I completely agree. And maybe that we even have to give them 30 days if we can't prove it's a short-term issue. So it would be 30 days. They'd have a right to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals. 
and but if we count a, a list of those violations, even if they weren't convictions, we could try to get an injunction from the court, and that would be enforced by the court. They could it would be a contempt citation, either um, a fine or jailable. Mr. Boss. I think you can appreciate now why the people from Bay Lake Pines are so exasperated. After you just heard this explanation, uh, I would be, and they're already dealing with it, and obviously it's not being dealt with well, I think is fair. And I think what I heard them say is, rather than having the city make provisions that would codify the behavior they're living with, which is not satisfactory, they want the city to enforce the current <coughs> zoning in their neighborhood which says that activity is not lawful. That's what our zoning court zoning thing says. Go back and you read the code. I went back and read it. It says rentals greater than 30 days. That's what printed in R10. So now the real question I would have is, if that was the will, I'm just saying that's what they express, but if that was our will and someone was conducting a short-term rental and it wasn't in complying with the zoning, so we don't care about warning them for the trash, or they're actually in violation of the zoning code, is that the same speedy process that we go through for that kind of violation? Because that's really the struggle we have. Because you're right, it's going on today. So if you say, oh, we're going to grandfather all the other people and try to somehow make good, if that was our intent, well, can we enforce the next day? Can we make sure no one else is repeating that behavior? Or would it take something from the General Assembly? Because people in Bay Lake Pines are suffering today not two years from now. What would be the situation in that case where we decided to move forward and actually, we could do that today even, if today we decided we were going to actually enforce our zoning ordinances, which I hope we do, but we haven't, but if we did, what would that process be? It would be that process. We would issue a notice of violation and that would start the process. They would have, because that's a long-term thing, they would have 30 days to comply. If they didn't comply, they'd get a summons, they would then have the right to appeal to the BZA and then go to court, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> yes, sir. That's the best we can do? That's the, that's the way the zoning ordinance is enforced. Where the people, for instance, in Bay Lake Pines are suffering is, is that these rentals, uh, these event, they're becoming event houses. That's what it comes down to. And, and you know, they're, they're, Somebody's renting them for a week, and they're having a big party in the house every night until 3 o'clock in the morning. They're out on the beach, and they're drunk, and, and they're basically disturbing everybody in the neighborhood. So uh, it's not, you know, the people, the families who come down and rent a house for a week or a month or whatever it is is not the problem. It's these houses that are being rented for parties, basically. That's that's what's causing the problem for them. And somehow we've got to address that. Do you know if they're being represented by a management company? How, how are they written? Do you know the process they're going through? Well, the one, I, the, the, the specific one I know about is being rented by Airbnb. And, and, uh, and, and, uh, I think that's what we're going to find out. And, and so I, I think the question as far as, and I'm talking specifically about Bay Lake Pines at this point in time, is we got to stop that. Now, what I want you to do is tell me how we're going to stop it. That, that's, that's, that's what, I, you know, uh, because it's, uh, it's just not right. It's not fair to the rest of the property owners. So, and, and it's not just Bay Lake Pine, so it's also in Chesapeake Beach. It's happening, and, and so forth. And you know, having had a beach house and still have a beach house, it, at one time I used to rent it out. I don't rent it out anymore, but but I did rent it out. But I didn't allow events in my house. <coughs> And uh, I, I just rented it to families, and and I told my real estate agent, you know, if you, if I find out you've rented it for an event, you're through. And so, uh, that was it. <coughs> and so, uh, I think the way 
the first step we have to take here is we have to find a way to stop these event houses from occurring. John, you had a follow-up on what Lewis was saying, uh, two, two points. and then Rosemary after that. Clearly, there's a latent demand for short-term rentals that haven't yet occurred because of the policies we have in place. So we need to be conscious of, you know, that as we look at what we do. But I think the public's going to at least going to expect, and rightfully so, that we fully exercise the powers and the ordinances that we do have, the, as unspeedy as they are, as we exhaust that ability while we turn to our friends in the General Assembly and say, we need some kind of legislative relief or proposal. It's not just for us. It ought to be some kind of regional look, but if they don't do it, we ought to step up. But in the interim, at least, you know, these R10, you know, R15 neighborhoods, this doesn't make any sense. And so we, I think unless we maximize our ability to enforce what laws does exist for these kind of things, people are going to say, okay, I realize how long it takes, but you're not even doing that. And so I think we've got to figure out the short-term solution is how do we resource, and the city manager first thing is going to tell us that's not free, and I understand that, but the same token that those people, are there, if, we, if you don't have a zoning administrator that's around at 11 o'clock, on a Friday night, they're not issuing a zoning ordinance. They're not over there doing that. They can't do it. So you got to think about how you're going to tactically address it. Because in the short run, that sounds to me like that's the tool that's in our toolbox, whether we want to go out and enforce the zoning ordinance as it is, or keep, I call it laissez-faire, look the other way, benign neglect, and let the short-term rentals continue but deal with the things that become the problem, well, then the only thing that deals with the problem is the process Mark just described, which is lengthy, but you got to do what you can do until you can figure out how you can get people to help you so you can have a more expeditious but due process way of adjudicating the outliers. And I agree to Mr. Mayor, it's not the people who are managing and the active management is here. I think they kind of get on top of that, but that's not always the case, but I think it's mostly the case. Whatever. But Airbnb is where a lot of these places are going to be because it's not this concentrated service area like Sandbridge, and they don't want to carry all that overhead that goes with that. That's the Airbnb model. Well, this is just the tip of the iceberg, I think, and I think that's what Bay Lake Pines is telling us, that as this starts, other things go for sale, people buy it with no intention of living, of living there, and now our, na our neighborhoods have changed, and we look like we have enabled it, and in part, if we don't do something, we have. And is that a conscious choice? I think our people came out last night and says, help us, that's not what we want to have happen. So I'm in favor of short-term enforcing the laws that we have to the extent that we can under this laborious but due process that we have, and then look at what legislative changes we have to get to be able to deal with it more expeditiously, not to stifle capitalism, but to protect other people's property rights in their home, and they, they're not being protected. I, I think that's, if I may, Mr. Sure, Mayor. absolutely. I think John's probably verbalized better than what I had, than I did. I thought you that, verbalized it very well. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, uh, uh, I think we have to start looking and formulate some type of, of uh, a zoning or requirement, uh, put event houses under conditional use permits in, in the neighborhoods that we can and, con and try to uh, control the, those type of activities because that's where the, the, the major part of the problem is occurring. And, uh, uh, and that, you know, that's, uh, and if our code doesn't, our ordinance doesn't do that now, then we need to change our ordinance because we can't continue to allow in uh, in the neighborhoods for this type of activity to, to 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 go on. It's it's just disruptive. It's unfair, and to the people who own the properties next to them, and it's our responsibility to protect these property owners who are being adversely affected. That's all. Rosemary. I guess I st still have questions and trying to sort through all of this. And 
I mean, you've got Bay Lake Pines, but you've also yeah. got like the North End, who they've been doing short-term rentals, uh, not to the extents of Sandbridge, but they've been doing short-term rentals for years. But as Lewis said, they've been managed by the real estate companies, and so there's someone there all the time. Well, well that's uh, no, well, good. So, so I guess my other question is, can we allow the short-term rentals as long as they're they have to if they're managed by someone locally? Well, let me be clear. And again, I think I've got the read of the council here, but this is when you can sit back and correct me. Uh, I don't think we're after anyone that's not anyone that's managing their property appropriately. I don't believe that we have issues with it all. And, yeah. I mean, am I, is that a fair statement? But it seems like the ones that are being mismanaged are the ones that are, <coughs> there's no one on, locally watching out for them and watching out for the property. It's an entity that who knows where they are, that everything goes online, and there's no one to look into it. I mean, is there any way we can have local... Oversight. Well, technically, we are by us requiring that it, it could even be an individual. I mean, we're, we cannot require that a management company be managing a piece of property. But we can require that, I mean, Mark, I'm assuming we can acquire, because it's been part of ongoing meetings, that someone should be within a 30-mile, 30 30-minute 30 <laughs> Uh, time frame to get to the property. I come back, and my twenty thousand dollar question is, how does Airbnb do that? I imagine they're going to come up and say, "Well, here's Johnny, my son, or my friend, or my relative," and I'm afraid that all of a sudden, when we need that contact, it might not be available. I think there's some risk there, but I don't think we can dictate that a management company has to manage the property. Am I correct on that? I would have real constitutional concerns about making a distinction between, you know, by requiring an industry to be included within the rental. Yeah, but that's not what I yeah, said. Yeah, you couldn't I do it. There had to be some local it. oversight. Well, well, and that's what we tried to write in by saying that somebody has to be available that can respond. And so if no one responds, what's the repercussions for that? If, if no one is available to respond, then that would be one of the strikes, and that would be something that would, would either go towards revoking the, the, the registration, because in this case there would be a registration if there wasn't a licensed... Uh, real estate entity associated with the property, and two, after it happened uh, some number of times, we would then go get the injunction against being able to allow them to rent because there was never, body, never anybody available as required by our ordinance. But there's just not a magic bullet where the first time something happens, if this is a permitted <coughs> use, we can shut it down. There's, I, I'm just trying to be honest with you about that. I think we've all picked having up that, on that, John. that local... Yeah. Oversight with the phone number in the 30 minutes, I think that helps, even though if it is Airbnb, yeah. it's got to be somebody local. It's better than nothing. Uh, John? There's really two issues here, I think. One, do you think that to be able to short-term rental that we should modify our zoning ordinance so that it's a primary use and it's a matter of right, which it is not today? Under our zoning ordinance, it is not a permitted use, clearly. That is, people might not like that, but anyone who's doing it is violating the zoning ordinance. So the question is, first, you could say, well, we're going to start enforcing our ordinance, before, but we're going to grandfather, which we've talked about, not someone who's built an income and a cash flow and some investment, going with that and then protecting that right, but we're not going to incur or permit further infractions. But I heard people in Bay Lake Pines was, wasn't just the short-term rentals. They also said they didn't want their neighborhood to become a motel. So they're wanting us to preserve the integrity and enforce the current zoning ordinance. That's what I heard those people say. I went back and watched the video. Because uh, it hasn't been a standard practice in their neighborhood. It hasn't always been the case. 
I know you hear, I've asked my own neighbors, and I'm sure there's some of your neighbors, Mr. Vice Mayor, I'm sure you've heard the same thing that I've heard. And so that's another question that's on top of all this, because fundamentally, if you don't have a means of enforcing that, in reality, we just continue the current policy, which has been one of benign neglect, and only deal with the things when they cause a problem, because that is the current status quo approach we have taken. I'm not saying it's good or bad, it's just the approach that we've taken. And if you do it long enough, like at Sandbridge, it becomes the status quo. And then it's, you can never turn back that clock. It's not realistic. But people are telling us, we appreciate that Sandbridge is different, but don't let us become the next Sandbridge. That's what I kind of heard a little bit. You might have all heard something different. I appreciate that. So I don't know how we get, Mr. Mayor, that, that piece of, which is the Planning Commission's recommendation. And I know when I'm out in the community, I am not hearing a lot of positive feedback that, that people want short-term rentals to be a primary use across all residential zonings. So I don't know. It's going to take a lot of legal help, I think, Mr. Mayor, to try to figure out how to get resource the enforcement. Right? I think we have to do that. And then do we really have a, a, a meaningful way to really enforce the zoning code that we have? I, I, I have my doubts. But I, I do think I've appropriately characterized where we're at. Aubrey, you want to say something? Put your hand. Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm just having a whole lot of trouble saying things are totally unacceptable in certain residentially zoned areas but are perfectly fine in others. I, I really think everybody deserves to be treated equally. I think we have something called equal protection under the law, and that really gives me a lot of trouble. Um, but I did have also had a question, and I put it forth in January, because I'm really concerned about this uh, making um, a principal use uh, in all of these residential areas, which includes uh, the agricultural area. And I asked the question about just how big these single-family residences can get, because what you have to remember is all of these structures in their building permit were checked for being single-family residences. And I think that's also a lot of the problem that we have. And the answer, because you know, my concern with the agricultural area is that these are very large parcels, at least an acre, some of them five acres, 10 acres, 40 acres. So you don't have the same restrictions that you would have with a lot that's just a residential zone lot as far as setbacks and so forth goes. So the only limitations, according to the city attorney's office, on building size arise from the requirements for setbacks, height, light coverage, and impervious cover. So we can look at some really large single-family residences in the agricultural area. And so I asked the question, well, if this wasn't an application for a single-family residence, but said it was a bed and breakfast, would there be other building code requirements? And of course the answer is absolutely there would. And so I think a lot of our problem too is we don't have anything in our ordinance, not only that calls it a single short-term rental, but we don't have anything that calls it an event house. So just what is an event house? Is it just something that's got a lot of bedrooms or just what is it? We would have that problem. But we get into the building codes and the answer I had here was that the Uniform Statewide Building Code defines bed and breakfast ends as a transient use, which must meet the same building requirements as hotels. But the Uniform Statewide Building Code does not define short-term rentals as a transient use, even though we collect the transient occupancy tax there. Accordingly, if an owner advised the building official that they were building a single-family structure for use as a short-term rental, the building official has indicated that only single family requirements would apply, must apply. And that's what's gotten us into this mess as well. And it also means that these structures have no fire safety codes and so forth that would be required if it were a transient use. And I don't think that's a very good message that we want to send out to the world that in Virginia Beach you can just say, I'm building a single-family residence, and then you don't have to worry about things like fire safety and so forth. Uh, I think we want people to feel like when they come to Virginia Beach, they're going to be in a place that's safe. 
And so I really think this is a major question, and I really have concern if we open up the agricultural area, because we could then potentially have some really very big structures <laughs> that are single-family residences that have none of these uh, safety codes, and, and there's nothing about the number of bedrooms. You know, this infamous uh, Lexington ordinance, surprisingly, has a maximum of six people who can be guests in these, uh, these houses, or six adults. Uh, you know, we're, we're getting pretty high up there. Uh, so it's not a function of the number of bedrooms and so forth that makes it an event house. It's the use. And I think that goes back to the whole issue. But I would like to have a, some answers, you know, before we certainly get into making this a principal use, as the Planning Commission recommended in all of our areas that allow residential, you know, what are we going to do in the agricultural area? Uh, to, to put some kind of limit on how big these structures can get. And I would also want to know uh, if this is a principal use, would this be allowed on ARP property? Uh, I think we really have to be careful about these unintended consequences that we're going to be unleashing with all of this. And so if you could give me that answer, especially before we adopt anything, if it's going to be next week. Well, you're reaching into something that, and again, Council, I'm thinking out loud with you on this, but I'm going down some issues that have already been brought up. I think the home sharing we're all pretty good on. Management issues, I truly want to, I wouldn't object to someone from Airbnb coming here and telling us how they're going to protect us, you know, from a home that they're managing being, you know, if an issue comes up. I'd like to hear from Airbnb, to be fair. We do. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm talking about Virginia Beach right well, here. they were on the ad hoc committee for Virginia Beach when we had it. Okay, well, I, I'd, like, I'd like that. I'm here seeing nods on the head. I, I think we come back to the laws and the zoning that, that we've talked about. And I think we can, and I'm throwing a lot of this back to staff here, council, to follow up with us on. You know, I think we've talked about the noise issue, for instance. We're not going to be able to do it on decibels. You know, we're going to have to come up at 10 o'clock or something along those lines. Th those issues that have been brought up by the Planning Commission in other uh, meetings, I I'd like to know, I'd like to have that list again, and what's enforceable and isn't enforceable. Some things were not enforceable, and I, I think we need to go through that. I still would like, I agree with Jim on the three strikes you're out. I, and I think this council does. I think that, you know, I, from what I'm hearing, the process right now is going to be awfully long anyway. And if we could start that process sooner, it seems to me, it would be to our advantage. I don't know if that could be some thoughts to be brought back to us or not to do it legally. You know, we've heard conditional use permits. You know, what would be the appropriate time to have that and, and not? And it gets back to that application, conditional use permit, or can you also put an STR on that application when you're going for new construction? Again, these are things I think I'm picking up on. Enforcement of zoning ordinances. You know, we really are going to have to figure out how to do this. And yes, Jim, I'm with you on the police coming for certain situations, but for all of a sudden, I'm thinking like parking. You know, I, I know that police can come deal with that, but I'm hoping that zoning can deal with that perhaps as well. I know when we were talking about that some time ago, and, and the garbage cans and stuff like that, you know, maybe a block where law enforcement is and a block where we have to have zoning, you know, divided up along those lines. Um, can def I ask a question Please. Because I see Kevin's here. Um, with, with respect to, to zoning after normal hours, how many inspectors do we have that work weekends and nights and things like that? Right now we have five inspectors in the field and they work weekends and nights Did on we an as needed basis. If an issue is summer. coming up, we send Did someone out at night or weekend, but summer. it's not on a regular schedule at this moment. So, so, so the, 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 the issue here is if we're going to 
do this, we're going to have to add staff. Why am I thinking we did one for Sandbridge last year? Did we not, or did we just talk about it? Did we what? Have Create a zoning? In I know we talked about it. Did we do it? Add staff in. Cre create a zoning inspector for Sandbridge? We were going to, yes. After hours. Negative. Okay. We, we, uh, okay. We, I know we, we talked about it. We instituted 311. Okay. And and, right. and we provide we moved to twenty four hour seven day a week three one ones what we okay. instituted. Okay, other issues have been brought up defining of an event home. I don't know if that's possible or not. Um, and that leads me to we've been talking forty minutes, which we could talk the whole three hours, uh, two hours. It doesn't whatever y'all want to do. But I think for us to sit back and say that we're going to have something good for to vote on next Tuesday would be wrong on our part. And, <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. I agree with all that with you. I'm on a roll. But, but, but I'm serious, though. But we can't, we got to keep on top of this. And I don't know if we have weekly updates every two weeks, you know, and a lot of this has fallen, well, I guess on both the city manager and the city attorney. And, but I, I think we should acknowledge we will not be acting next week. And that yet, Maybe we can get an update on some of the things that we've brought up, and we will be bringing up other things because we're, we haven't concluded this part of our uh, uh, session. Yes, sir. I would like to add to that list because it would take longer, but I do think we, it, now that, because Barbara's right, we're going to have redevelopment as well and tear down of homes and things in the established What's parts of the city. Sandbridge to be a seen it? We need to look at what is it we want the Planning Commission, how would we need to amend our current residential zoning ordinances to make sure that his lots are torn down and things get back. Some of the issues that Barbara mentioned and other places have done successfully, which is number of, you, know, you don't need a 15 bedroom home, you know, in, in Aragona Village or in, in some of these places or that little place on <coughs> Shore Drive or any pl Prince Sam Plaza. How do we go about looking so that we, we catch how we got here? I think that ought to be part of that process. And I know that's not popular among many people, but it's basically what has happened at Sandbridge. We basically, I know, have an overlay district in effect. Someone has said the special service district is in fact a primary use district for SDRs. There may be other places in the city where that's what people really want and they want to change their zoning. They want that to be their choice. And then there's gonna be people where they, where they don't. And I don't think that violates any due process consideration for making people pay taxes based on 80% of the people saying yes and the 20% saying no. And they're not, <laughs> they're being treated equally within the district but I think we can, I think we got to look at all the choices so that the public really knows what they're reacting to. to your point, Mr. Mayor, is, is getting ordinances that the, the attorneys can show us how they're actually enforceable so that we don't set a false expectation. I think that is key, that we know we can actually do it and what's the process. As a matter of fact, the city attorney wanted to get my attention, sir. But there's also <laughs> building on 22nd Street, and they... They're meant to be short-term rentals. They look like townhouses all grouped together. And they're doing a great job with them. Yeah, they look, they're really nice looking, but they're being built to be short-term rentals. I, I just wanted to, to, to give you a couple of informational touch points. You know, w with respect to concerns about enforcement of the zoning ordinances it's written right now, there was a time not that long ago where if the zoning administrator and staff were made aware of an Airbnb rental that they took enforcement action to shut down that Airbnb rental. Uh, when, when Airbnb continued to grow, when it became a, a statewide issue, and when we sat back and realized that, hey, look, short-term rentals are occurring, you know, at a high rate throughout our city, the concern became that it's really unfair to be selectively enforcing that prohibition against Airbnb. And that's when, it's like two years ago, we started talking about what do you really want your code to say about short-term rentals so that staff can have clear direction on where to enforce and where not to enforce. So, so there has in the past been, uh, we've actually filed suit, I think, against one Airbnb rental some years ago. Um, the, the, the second thing I would say is with respect to this whole building uh, code issue and what the, 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 the building official looks at when they get an application, 
that had been one of the reasons why we started thinking about your alternative too, because we realized that people were coming in and saying, we're building a single family home with 10, 12 bedrooms, six baths, whatever it is. But, you know, the building official really didn't have discretion to say, we don't believe you when you say that's a single family home. The way alternative two would have helped with that issue, or at least that was the thought process, was you can tell us you're building, you know, a single family home, but if you come in and start to rent it, there's going to be a CUP requirement, so you can't say I had no ex I had no idea that I might be limited in how I was going to be able to use this property when I presented it and got it built. So you could build the 12 bedroom home if you wanted to, but you understood that if it's a new or redevelopment, you run the risk that you have to come to council and council doesn't give you the CUP, so don't believe coming in that you're, you're getting all the way to the finish line just by saying I'm building a single family home. That was one of the reasons for the CUP requirement with the grandfather was, was to, to, to try to address that. Um, I will tell you from a staff perspective, these are all good comments. How do you define an event home? We had an ad hoc committee and we had, uh, we had uh, another, you know, beaches and waterways who were uh, specifically tasked with trying to define when an event home was an event home. Um, and, you know, we got their recommendations and basically to a large degree, their recommendations are included in the ordinances that were before you. Yep. Uh, so um, I, I, I guess what I just want you to know is these are all valid issues. These are all valid points. The, the three strikes you're out agree with you. It's, it's going to be very difficult to get that to make a meaningful difference. Um, we've used a lot. We, we've spent a lot of time thinking about these issues and, and frankly, the three alternatives that we gave you was our best thinking at the time on those issues. And um, I don't know that our thinking has progressed a great deal in the time that's passed since that, but we'll keep thinking. We'll keep working. <laughs> you know, we understand that, I that, appreciate that the direction is coming. The other thing that I will have to say to you is these are planning items. They had to be advertised. They have been advertised. So there will be an item on your agenda next week. Now, it can be an item that says these matters are deferred indefinitely uh, and council and staff is direct, will, will, will be coming back to brief on a, 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 a monthly basis or biweekly basis. It can be whatever you want it to be, but there will have to at least be an item on. Why don't we put there deferred for 30 days and we can always extend that time frame as we continue to move forward. But we're going to have to stay on top of this. Yes, sir. Only because we're doing the budget, and I know that the staff thing, I would say 60 only because of the budget. You process. know, Mr. Moss, I agree with you. <laughs> I'm buying a lottery ticket. That's two things ticket. today. We better watch out. We'll buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. If this is not being dealt with now, please be aware that it's the entire council that's making this decision and not just one. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think, you know, this is a very King, King Solomon type of decision. There's definitely two distinct arguments that kind of go counter to each other. First of all, you know, short-term rentals, we're a resort city. It's an industry in this city. And a lot of the folks that I've heard about through this own homes that they generate income. Like some folks will live in their home and then give it up for summer rental. You know, that type of thing. And when we came down, um, when we were going to the Outer Banks, we were able to get all the cars. We'd have three or four families stay in a four- to five-bedroom house, but we were able to get all the cars in, in the driveway. But, but the point being, too, that we got to protect the neighborhoods, and I think we do have a lot of ordinances that we're just not enforcing in this time that the first thing we should do is do that. That's something we can do, hopefully, right away to give some – you know, relief to the neighborhoods, you know, going forward. But one of the things I think Lewis really hit on, that if you have a 15-bedroom house, my goodness, that, that I don't see how that could be classified as, you know, I, you know, I think the term was used, a motel or that type of thing. And I think that deserves special consideration, special type of uh, conditional uses and everything. 
And I'll just finish by saying this. One of the things when, even when we get bad neighbors that live in full-time homes, what I would do is steer them to the fourth, you know, the precinct CACs where they got the police and the code enforcement there. And they would say, hey, listen, I got a troublesome neighbor that parties all the time or doesn't mow the grass or anything. Those things get taken care of. But the thing is, we got the rules on the books now. And I think if we can demonstrate to the public that we're going to enforce them starting now, I think that would be helpful, even as we're delaying. Uh, well, okay, Ms. Finley. Well, there's already something in the state code that, you know, it's an R1, and then it triggers to be an R5, depending on how many guests are there and how many bedrooms. Maybe we should just look at using the state regulations. Put that on the list. All right, any, I mean, I'm not trying to cut anyone off now. I mean, this is going to be an ongoing conversation, but if anything else to be added at this point, very good conversation. Thank you all. And we'll move on to Mr. Hanson's. Yes, sir. Uh, I, thought, Festival. I, I thought after your short-term rental we'd have something entertaining, so I'd like to introduce <laughs> to you to the executive director of the Virginia Arts Festival, Mr. Rob Cross. Rob, we're glad to have you here. Welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, council, and city manager, uh, for this opportunity to give you an update on some of the great things happening at the Virginia Arts Festival and kind of a reminder of, of some of the work we do. Um, so just as, as I start, I'd like to remind you that Virginia Arts Festival, kind of the three pillars we're built on, are bringing some of the world's great artists to Virginia Beach and our community for our citizens to enjoy and also to create fantastic opportunities for our young people with these artists that are coming into town. And then an, another piece of it that's just important, I know near and dear to all of our hearts, it kind of touches on what we're talking about earlier, is to increase tourism in that shoulder season. And I know one of the goals of Virginia Beach is to come, become a year-round tourism destination. So Virginia Arts Festival, part of our creation is how do we increase tourism in that April, May period when the, the hotels do have occupancy? and how do we be a vital part of economic development. So first I thought I'd just touch on some of the world-class artists who the Virginia Arts Festival has brought to Virginia Beach in the past. Uh, Chris Bodie has been here with us several times before. It, it's Ock Perlman who opened the Sandler Center, but has also been back to the, the Sandler Center many times. Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. Joshua Bell, arguably the world's greatest violinist today, has been with us several times. Palopolis Dance Company the Israel Philharmonic. And then, as I mentioned earlier, tourism and getting the word about the cities as a cultural tourism destination is a big part of the festival. So almost all of our classical concerts are recorded and then they're offered for nationwide broadcasts. So about 15 of our concerts per year are broadcast by National Public Radio and Performers Today. And every time one of those concerts are broadcast, they're talking about this is brought to you live from Sandler Center Performing Arts or from First Presbyterian Church. So it's a great advertisement for the festival and for the city and for the region. Uh, we've had a couple of recent national broadcasts. Last year, working in partnership with WHRO, we brought in Ask Me Another, one of their fantastic shows that was broadcast, recorded and broadcast nation live, nationwide from the Sandler Center. And then the tattoo, which we know happens in Norfolk, but a lot of the participants, both the audience members and the cast are staying in Virginia Beach. That was broadcast, taped by uh, PBS, and that was broadcast nationwide. I think it was picked up in 114 markets this past year. Wow. Tourism, big part of it. I've invited my colleague, Diana Stark, who's our director of tourism, to say a few words about some of the initiatives that are going on in, in our tourism world. Good Welcome afternoon, you. everybody. Good afternoon. So tourism is a big part of what the mission is of the Arts Festival. And last year alone, we had visitors that came from near and far. Um, we had a lot of tour groups and uh, other visitors that came in. Last year, we had over um, close to 9,000 tickets that were actually sold to people coming in from outside of the area, specifically coming to 31 different festival events. Um, we had 261 groups that attended the spring spring events and they came on 220 buses which is a lot of buses and a lot of people we like to say it's it's better to sell uh, 50 tickets at a time than one ticket at a time so uh, we do go after those larger groups uh, one of the 
uh, biggest tourism draws for the Virginia Arts Festival is the Virginia International Pan Fest. Um, this is both uh, part of the education program and also the tourism program of the Arts Festival. It is the only event of its kind in the United States, and it is held right here in Virginia Beach on the 24th Street stage. Uh, it launched in 2003 with nine bands and about 200 students, and over the course of the years, uh, it's reached over 290 bands, 6,400 participants, and they've traveled from as far away as Trinidad and Tobago, the Dominica, and also the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, what's great about this is you know, these are kids that are aged from kindergarten and really young kids all the way on up to adults, and they're st playing steel drum music all weekend long. It's it's fantastic, and if you haven't seen it, please come out and see it. One of the best things for the hotels is that they do come and they stay for, on average, two nights, so the hotels like that as well. Um, so again, tourism, um, where do they come from? Um, typically, we have about 48 um, states that are represented. Um, that is true again last year, and that included also Washington, D.C., um, people come from all over the world to come and take part in the Arts Festival. Um, so last year alone we had seven uh, countries that were represented and then plus Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. So again, it, it keeps growing. So we work very closely with the Virginia Beach Convention and Visitors Bureau. And this is a list of a number of the trade shows and travel shows that we work in partnership with the CVB. Um, and I've just listed a few of them, IPW, uh, which is an international association, American Bus Association. And this list really goes on. We, we really work very closely um, in collaborating how do we help market uh, the city of Virginia Beach with the Virginia Arts Festival uh, events. The destination is always the first thing that you want to sell. And then what's another reason for them um, to come? And that is a message that we put out there um, together. And that It really works quite well. Although we do a lot of advertising as well. So um, uh, last year we had over 5.6 million uh, impressions. We did over 20 um, out of market advertising. That's part of the mission of the festival is to draw those visitors to come in. So you've got to go out there and advertise to them. Um, th some of this is just a, a quick little highlight, like TripAdvisor, we do Style Weekly, um, AAA magazines, some of the other industry magazines as well, um, in addition to New York Times, we do quite a bit of Facebook advertising and digital ads as well. And we look very closely at what the, the city is doing, what the CVB is doing, and we, we work cooperatively with them on that. And now back to Rob. Thank you, Diane. Sure. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, education outreach is a big part of the festival's mission. These are a couple of things that happened last season. Uh, Tin Thing, which is a brass ensemble out of Denmark, doing a workshop at Lansdowne High School. And the Royal Winnipeg Ballet, which was in residence here for a week, doing a master class at Salem High School. I'll talk about a few highlights of, of this year's festival, the 2017-2018 uh, season. In December, we had a sold-out performance of the Vienna Boys Choir at Sandler Center, which was a fantastic performance. It was their last performance of this year's tour. In May, we have the Parsons Dance Company, one of the great American contemporary dance companies coming. And then Miami String Quartet will be in the Miller Studio at the Sandler Center. Diana mentioned the Pan Festival two days in May. And then we'll have a Mozart celebration in the, in the main theater at the Sandler Center. Uh, Anu Michelle Schub, who is the 1981 Van Cliburn gold medalist, will leave that, lead that concert with the Virginia Symphony. And that concert will be recorded for a nationwide broadcast on national public radio. And then this year, the Virginia Arts Festival is part of the worldwide celebration of the 100th anniversary of Leonard Bernstein's birth. It's a really big, big deal. We're working, uh, we're one of the members with the Bernstein Family Foundation. And our last concert of our part of the Bernstein fel uh, celebration will be at the Sandler Center on May 12th. And some, some amazing guest artists joining us for that. On your far right is Rob Fisher, considered uh, the world's leading Broadway conductor. He's actually a Norfolk native, went to Norview High School. He's the only uh, music director that has had three shows on Broadway at the same time. He's the worldwide music director for Chicago. On the left, is far left, is Michaela Bennett. 
a uh, recent graduate of the Juilliard School, and it's a really rising star in the music theater world. Just had a world premiere in New York in January. Got fantastic reviews in, reviews in the New York Times. And to her right, or our right, is Ross Lakaita, and he's a new cast member in Frozen, which is getting ready to open on Broadway. And then next to her is our special guest, Brooke Shields. If she'd admit, like to meet the mayor when she's here, I'll make myself available. <laughs> he has asked if she could have a reception. Uh, everyone knows her from her movie star days, but she's also a, a fantastic Broadway star. She's been on Cabaret in Chicago on Broadway and gotten fantastic reviews. So this will be with the Virginia Symphony. Um, so that's a big, big deal for the, the festival. Uh, Rob has been part of the Worldwide Celebration for the Bernstein Celebration. So he opened their year-long celebration at the Kennedy Center in November with the National Symphony Orchestra, and he'll close that part of it with, in Carnegie Hall in May, right after he's here in Virginia Beach with the New York Philharmonic. This year's education program is very, very vibrant. Uh, we have Mariah Brass was in a couple weeks ago doing workshops at Kellam High School, Princess Anne, and Larkspur. Uh, TU Dance was here doing, this is a master class at Brickell Academy. And then we have Bur Birmingham Royal Ballet that will be here for a week um, in May, and they'll be doing workshops at Salem High School at Brickell Academy, and then a lot of Virginia Beach uh, Public School students will be going to the Friday morning student matinee. And uh, all Virginia Beach Public School middle school students attend at the Virginia International Tattoo, um, all the band students course and orchestra students. And some of the groups from the tattoo will be doing a residency at Tallwood High School with his band of the Majesty of the King's Guard. So he'll be doing a side-by-side -side concert. And then we have student matinees of Macbeth with the American Shakespeare Festival and Par Parsons Dance. Um, you know, one of the things I'm really excited about the tattoo this year is uh, the theme this year is the medal. Of, uh, we're honoring the Medal of Honor recipients. There are only 73 living Medal of Honor uh, recipients, and six of them will be with us for, here with the whole week, attending the performances and being in our community. And they're also going to be doing a reenactment of the changing of the guard at the unknown tomb in Washington, D.C. It's the only time in the history of the tomb they've ever done the ceremony off-site. So that's kind of a big deal for us. That would be unbelievable. And finally, uh, obviously all these great things we're doing for quality of life and our young people, it also comes back to what are we doing to build a community. Um, about three years ago, we hired a company on the recommendation of Virginia Tourism Corporation and the Virginia Beach CBB to do an economic impact study. And they use very, very conservative numbers and say that they estimate that our economic impact over the last five years has been about $75 million. Um, we can document, because of our ticket software system, where our ticket buyers are coming from and how long they stay. And 33% uh, of our ticket buyers are people traveling from outside of Hampton Roads that are coming here specifically for the festival. So when you go to a festival performance, someone on your left or your right should be someone that's out of town visiting us here in the community. Um, back to what our goals are to bring attention to Virginia Beach and our community as a cultural tourism destination, to work in collaboration with the Visitors Commission Bureau to help Virginia Beach become a year-round destination and to really uh, create opportunities for our young people to be able to experience these world-class artists. So thank you for your time and thank you for the partnership. Virginia Beach has been a partner with us since the festival started in 1997. Well, Cafe. Rob, we appreciate the wonderful talent you bring and also uh, bringing new people to the city and also uh, sharing with our schools. Very important stuff. We thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Okay. <clears throat> Stormwater. Where's Mark Jones? So uh, the Public Works team is coming through the door. And uh, remember, we have uh, th three components. We have operations. Uh, we have water quality. And we have water quantity. And so uh, it, takes, uh, it takes a village to manage stormwater in Virginia Beach. And... Uh, so I've got uh, three of the best managers uh, possible here today. And uh, I guess Tony is going to, you're first up. I am. Tony, we're glad to have you. Good afternoon, Mayor, ma members of council. I'm going to start the uh, presentation today to, to uh, discuss some of the uh, budget issues that the stormwater program continues to have. As you know, flood control has become a critical neighborhood issue and is more complicated and expensive. Stormwater quality regulations and permitting are more demanding and compliance is mandatory. More complicated projects 
and regulations are increasing operation and maintenance requirements. And aging infrastructure is increasing the amount of maintenance needs. So all of this I'm pointing out to you to, to note that future stormwater utility fee increases will be necessary to address current and future funding needs for stormwater management projects. And before she moves off, the new administration has actively gone out and asked people to come forward and to solicit and request waivers from regulations that don't make sense. Have we engaged the feds on their invitation to actually pursue those waivers and relief from things that don't make sense? I know other communities are. Are we pursuing any of those? Yeah, we, we we work through DEQ, Mr. Moss, uh, and the state because the state's underneath uh, uh, the uh, court findings with the EPA and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and TMDL requirements. Uh, we're all the time pushing them hard on some of their perspectives, and we've been very fortunate for them being here and doing the Veterans uh, Hospital uh, stormwater program, and I can tell you they're learning a lot about how different the coastal region is to the Piedmont where they put a lot of their rules in well, place. I understand the consent decree, but the EPA is a party to that agreement. There is a new managerial philosophy at the EPA than there was in the prior administration. I'm just asking, is the state engaging that new philosophy and looking for relief that makes sense? That's all I'm asking. I ask you to pursue that. Yes, they're sir. very open to new ideas. Will do. Um, the Stormwater Capital Improvement Program is made up of three sections, uh, flood control, water quality and regulatory compliance, and operations and maintenance. Uh, I'm going to give the flood control portion of the CIP, followed by Melanie Coffey, who will present on the water quality and regulatory compliance CIP, and Mark Jones will wrap up the presentation on operations and maintenance CIP. Uh, this is how the funding in the stormwater program is distributed among those sections. As you can see, flood control is the largest at 46% or $123.5 million, followed by operations and maintenance at 35% at $95.5 million, and then water quality and regulatory compliance at 19% or $51.7 million. And this is a total budget, six-year budget of $270.7 million. These are the projects in the flood control proposed stormwater CIP. You can see the allocations for each one of those projects shown here. The flood control section consists of 18 projects and programs for a six-year total of $123.5 million. The water quality and regulatory compliance uh, CIP consists of six projects and programs for a six-year total of $51.7 million. And the operations and maintenance section consists of eight projects and programs for a six-year total of $95.5 million. Again, total budget $270.7 million. Uh, this year, we submitted three additional funding requests. Um, they are shown here. The first one is canal management phase one. We have asked for $2 million per year for a total of $12 million. The second one is the 42nd Street Outfall Lining and Repair Project. We've asked for year one funding in the amount of $4 million. And the last one, Pinewood Road Stormwater Drainage Improvements. Uh, this is uh, year one funding in the amount of $1 million. All three of these projects are maintenance and operations projects, and Mark Jones will discuss them in further detail on his part. Uh, now let's get into the flood control projects. These are the projects that we completed in 2017, the Cape Henry Tide Gates, North Lake Holly Section 4, South Lake Holly Sections 1 and 2, and Thalia Drive Culvert Improvements. And in 20, oh, I'm sorry. For those projects later, Commissioner, if I could, can, can we be able to articulate some, which one of these apply to um, then when they were done that we met the higher 10-year and 100-year standard as a consequence or if it had no impact it would be nice to be able to tell the to know which projects are making a uh, material difference getting us to the higher standard and which ones were just now us to, to maintain the status quo if we could get that later okay thank you these are the projects that are currently under construction in 2018 uh, northgate ditch and windsor woods canal south lake holly section four 
Bellamy Manor Outfall Ditch, the Lake Smith Weir Replacement Project, and North Lake Holly Section 3A. <coughs> now I'm going to go into the individual projects in the Flood Control CIP. I'm going to go through these quickly because I will be back in a couple weeks to give you the quarterly briefing on all the flood control projects. Uh, so let's start with Aragona drainage improvements. <coughs> this project's fully funded. Total project cost of $3.76 million. The design is approximately 90% complete, and we expect to advertise for construction this summer. Asheville Park drainage improvements. The total project cost for the ultimate project is approximately $35 million. Uh, that leaves a balance to complete of $26 million. The Phase 1 design is underway and approximately 30% complete. We expect that towards the end of the month. We're working on a cost participation agreement with the developer, and the estimated cost of the Phase 1 improvements is between $11.2 million and $13.5 million, and that's depending on the excavation costs. And this is Alternative B, correct, Mr. Manager? Yes, Phase, phase 1. Phase 1. Right, thank you. Yes. Uh, there's currently $9 million allocated to this project. I, I have some comments, and I know we're going to talk about it later, but I can't let this go past with that $35 million sitting up there without some comments. <coughs> you know, we've been talking about what we enforce and what we don't enforce. I wasn't on the council when this was approved, but mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot of reading, and I've brought a lot of it with me, and I've got a whole lot more at home. But ever since 2004, when this uh, development was first approved, it's always been a conditional zoning. I was always under the impression that when we did a conditional zoning project, that we were approving a specific site plan or a specific plan for the overall development. And if that plan was not or could not be developed, it wasn't still in force. Well, what was approved in 2004, of course, then was changed a little bit in 2005, got changed again a little bit more, and we were looking at, again, another change in 2015 when we deferred it indefinitely because by that time we realized that there was something very badly wrong with that area. That original plan is not being developed, is not being developed, cannot be developed. And I don't believe that we are committed and that we have to allow and make certain that this project gets 499 units because that's what was approved in 2004. 499 units was a conditional approval for that plan that was approved at that time. They can no longer build that plan. So I really don't believe that there are 499 units that that developer is assured. And when I look at the fact that in order to do all of that, and this is from the uh, uh, thing we got two weeks ago, February 26, that um, I understand that this is a tough situation for HomeFed, the current developer, but it's also tough for the 299 families and villages A and B, and I appreciate that. Those are the people who are living there now, and I can see we have a, a responsibility to them. However, it says, and for the taxpayers in Virginia Beach that are being asked to fund phase one, and now it's it was eight point something, and now it's up to 13 and a half, so all of those original estimates were way under what it's going to cost. And then the rest of this to fund phase one and the more costly phase two at some future point. I just really have some problems that we're sitting here and committing some future council to another $26 million for this development that's only partially built I mean, if we're having to do all of this work and we're talking about having to go to the taxpayers to raise their stormwater fees for current properties and current people, but when we're doing it for future development, I've got a lot of problems. And I really don't think that this project is assured 499 lots because they are not building the plan that, they, that was approved for 499 lots. They can't build it, and they're not building it, and I don't think they've got any 499 assured lots. And I may be wrong, 
but that's where I'm looking at it now. I wasn't there. Some of you who were might want to comment on that, but I thought when we did a conditional zoning by a plan, we were approving that plan, and if it cannot be developed, I don't think it's supposed to be still approved. That's my opinion. I like to follow up on Ms. Henley's point because that gave to a question I had asked earlier about cost participation agreements and to the extent that the cost participation agreements make a plan that the Planning Commission may have passed on but that we have not approved and that's what that cost participation is based on a Planning Commission recommendation which we have not adopted. So I'm with Ms. Henley. I think that we should compartmentalize what we're doing to what's in place. And if council hasn't approved something, we shouldn't be entering into a cost, uh, a cost participation agreement that basically takes that decision space away because now we've already agreed to have a contract with people to pay something. I, you're getting the, the, the cost participation agreements ahead of the decision because it's premised on the Planning Commission recommendation, which we have not approved. We believe that you have an approved 499 and we're operating under that approval. The council can always go back and revisit that. I certainly don't have that authority to not allow you to say, okay, let's just not build any of it. The, the, the applicant that will come forward, the developer, Home Fed, they, uh, the planning, uh, Commission approved an additional uh, number of 418 or, or 518 or whatever the number really is, um, but we deferred that. And so that action has to come back to the city council. We are still trying to finalize uh, what a potential cost share partnership will be. Uh, the construction that needs to be done uh, associated with um, uh, their development, they're going to pay for. The additional costs of that stormwater is to provide additional relief to the existing uh, Sections A and Section B that are ha incurring that flooding. Uh, we are pretty solid on the modeling that tells us that our investment, uh, somewhere in that 11 to 13 million, depending on the cost per cubic yard of the, uh, of the excavation, provides a significant amount of relief uh, that exists uh, uh, to the threat that currently exists in A and B and with the cost contribution from the developer provides an opportunity for them to bring their homes online. We will be bringing that to the council for their decision. And, and Yeah, but we're also talking about allowing Village C and it's that D and E that I just don't think is there. And somewhere in all of these papers, I know I've, there is a statement that, of course, when they were coming forward for that change in 2015, it was precipitated because during the time it was fallow, additional wetlands were created in Village D, which did not allow that to be finished. And I'm sorry, I don't think we owe them D&E. I'm sorry. And anyway, we're not making, yes, ma'am. Let me just also say, when I look at the map, and you know, when this is, a, this is a really telling map. These are the watersheds in the city. This is the Chesapeake, this is the Atlantic, this is the southern watersheds. In all of this big area, in this listing of, of projects, there's three million for Sherwood Lakes and 35 million for Asheville Park, and we weren't supposed to be having to spend a dime of that. And I'm supposed to tell all of these other people down here that they have a project of $300,000 a year for everything down here. That's not going to fly, and I'm not going to be the one to tell them that that's what we're going to do because I'm not being held to that. We're getting ready, we're in the process of doing the sea level rise study and the stormwater studies, and when they come up with their recommendations at the end of the year, we don't know what the recommendations are going to be and what the implementation costs are going to be for these people. And to have to tell them, sorry, but we've allocated all of our money, and most of it is going to Asheville Park, and you're getting 300000 a year, too bad. We can't do anything for you until we raise your stormwater fee. That is not an appropriate answer. And I'm, I'm sorry, but I don't like having this thing sit there with that $35 million on Asheville Park. 
if it's something like 13 million that's going to take to relieve the existing A and B, that's a lot to swallow, but I, I, I think I can probably go there. But a balance to complete of 26 million. I agree with you. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, we don't have those funds programmed, and uh, we will be in a uh, wait and see mode until Dewberry provides us with their recommendations and we're able to model what sea level rise is and what the economic impacts of other requirements to reduce risks. So um, I think that the, the engineers have modeled this. Uh, this, is a, this is a swag number. I don't think that they have a confirmed uh, uh, level of confidence with regards to that cost estimate, but it's not programmed. I think what's key is I don't want home fed or anyone else thinking that the people that sit here today, or just speaking for myself, I think Barbara might be in the same place, is that they should have any, take away any indications from any cost participation agreement from A and B that that creates any emotional bond or any other consideration that there will be a favorable disposition about the development of the rest well, of their well, development. Well, to be fair, I think Dave said that. Well, well, it's I'm. Not what these it didn't. Say. It didn't come across that way. And if I didn't hear you right, I apologize I'm, and thank I you for saying that. I think they said it pretty clearly. But I, I might maybe I feel better now that I said it clearly. We are focused. <laughs> let me let me just <laughs> let me just <laughs> let me publicly state that we're only focused on Village C, and we've made no commitments to D and E, and 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 Tom. And we need to bring this back as a standalone conversation. Uh, y y I understand how you feel about this. We, we have sufficient funds to move forward uh, with uh, the phase one, and, but we are counting on Home Fed being a partner to do that. And, okay. and Shannon has a question, then Lewis. Sure. Um, yes, I met with a group of the homeowners today, as you know, from Asheville Park, and their concern um, was they've made concessions, if you will. They're willing to make concessions to allow the density in this next village, if you know, in the pond and the runoff and all of that. But their concern is, you know, we've made these concessions, we'll make this happen for now, but when the developer comes back in 5, 10, however many years, what's going to happen to villages D and E? Can't, and they asked me to ask the city attorney. I mean, I, as Barbara said, we can't commit future councils to doing anything. However, is there some type of um, legal document that we can say you that we can hold future councils that you cannot do anything in D&E or you can't do above a certain yeah, amount of D&E &E so that it so that it puts their mind at ease because that's their that's their reservation and hesitation is that they just don't know what the future is going to bring. But. You, you really aren't in a position to bind a future council on those kinds of issues. Even with a document. Okay. Well, we're being bound by a council that was before. In 2004, that say, approved yeah, yeah. this thing. I mean, and it's not being built. They can't build it because they're having to take all of what was going to be their wonderful green space and turn them into ponds, which, of course, got density credit and so forth, and they cannot build what was originally improved. So I just don't think that that original... Zoning has any any, any <coughs> leverage at all. Okay, I got not to bind us. I got Lewis, and I then I've got Ben. The money that you're the eleven point two to thirteen point five million, Dave. That's to fix the current drainage issues. It doesn't fix it. It improves it. It well improves it. To improves the current drainage issues in what has been developed, is that correct? And allows Section C to meet the stormwater requirements uh, well, for the enhanced... Section C and is not developed, right? Correct. So my question is, why are we spending money to help... What's the company's name? Home what? Home Fed. Home Fed. Bring on partial C. Uh, develop Section C. Uh, they bought this project out of bankruptcy, I think, or something like it's that. Correct. It was actually bankruptcy. And it was a trustee when they deal. bought it, didn't they accept that responsibility for de for future development of the project? So that, they built with the, the terms that were already there in the in the. Yeah, you want to interject something here? 
Yes, I, I was going to interject. I, I think, you know, I, I completely agree with what Barbara said about the conditional rezoning. Um, you know, the aspect that I, I think that we would be wise not to lose sight of is the cost participation factor. And if we were to, um, you know, uh, give Home Fed the idea that, um, you know, there is no room for negotiation um, on any way, what would prevent them from folding the LLC and walking away, which would leave us in an even worse problem. So uh, I think that we have to be careful that we don't leave Home Fed with the impression that there is no room for negotiation here. I think the worst thing that could happen is if they walked away. And Dave, we might as well sit home parks and wreck and shore drive because we're going to be on this for another half hour. If we decide to wrestle out uh, SL Park tonight, uh, as okay, opposed to having discuss. a project delivery meeting, and we can work that out, the the true answer is that I is not. I think we should send them home. I will, absolutely. Okay. Um, they're 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 listening. They know what's going on. They're back there. They're placing bets that we ain't getting to them. Um, Mr. Jones, I, would. I don't think your statement is correct. We're not spending money on their project, and Tom's been negotiating that. So since we're into it, let me let him just give you a thumbnail sketch. Okay. So phase one's primary purpose is to move water from east, from west to east. It takes the water from the four existing uh, ponds that are in between Wilshire and Rainier and moves it all the way over to Asheville Bridge Creek, including the modifications and the pump station to get that water out of the system. As a practical matter, it's almost impossible for us to design the system that gives relief to A and B and not be a, not have C be able to get into it. It's just it, 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 it it's just not practical. We can't size things like that, and it would be silly to do it given they have by right uh, development rights. Now, option one, uh, phase one, only will allow uh, the development of C, and it doesn't matter under any decision the council makes, whether the council uh, decides uh, uh, to allow additional density or not, phase one will handle that. Phase one will not allow D and E to develop. There are additional uh, features in D and E that have to be constructed, and the developer would have to either pay for them or, at a minimum, cost participate with them in the future. And finally, phase one does work independently of any future phases because a lot of the phase two work is actually digging up uh, the streets in Ash in the existing villages and replacing those pipes. But the thing about phase one is it keeps the water out of their homes in a 100-year storm, and the water will clear in hours instead of days. And that's what makes the big difference. I understand that, and I appreciate that. My concern is, is that we're not getting ourselves in a position, and it doesn't sound like we are, but I want I guess I would want to caution uh, that we should not get ourselves in a position to where we're going to be uh, paying for changes in design in D and E uh, when the owners of the property now bought that property, knowing what the condition was, and they're, they're re they should be responsible for improving D and E themselves without city participation. That's my thought. That's all. And we concur. That's what Tom said, and that w that is our operating principle as well. The Rolling Stones should be so friendly. But I keep reading that okay, uh, in Village C, they want they want five lots that they thought they would do in Village B that they didn't build. So we want, they want those five lots now over in Village C, and they want to take what 16 lots out of potential Village D and put in Village C. So they're still going by that original plan, and I just think that original plan is moot and maybe that's not right but if it's not the truth we need to know it for future things because i was always under the impression that when we approved a conditional zoning we were approving that plan and that plan was what had to get built or it wasn't viable and if that's not right let me know because we've got some well mark can you answer that i would like to see that All right. mark can you answer that okay can, can you address that <laughs> Well, okay, can you answer that? <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Um, when you approve a conditional rezoning, you are approving the plan substantially in compliance. And as such, many, most times, the plan is not exactly what you all approved. And so it is done substantially in compliance. The planning director normally moves a few things around that he does, he does not feel are substantially outside of the bounds. The, the project for Asheville Park was approved with 499 in all of these villages. And that's what they have. They have the right to have 499 lots as long as they can meet other development. They have to meet stormwater. They've got to meet floodplains. They've got to meet all of the other um, environmental and any other kind of regulatory thing. So when they go through final site plan review, the plan may change because they can't do some of the things where they wanted to do them. We normally try to get that early, particularly the, the stormwater. However, lots of times the regulations have changed on a lot of people, and so these are the reasons that it will not look exactly like what you thought it was going to look like. Does that mean the planning director can put those number of homes that she just spoke to in Section C? Uh, no, that has come back to you all. He didn't feel that was in substantial okay, was, compliance. So that went through planning commission. To know. So that <laughs> went through, as Kay said, that went through planning commission. We deferred, and Ms. Henley's right. They, 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 they originally wanted to do a land swap, uh, 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 a unit density swap with Elbow Farms. That, that's, that's kicked to the curb, and they, they are taking those density from D and E. There were two different applications, one Check. that dealt with Elbow Farms and then the other one that just dealt with these yeah. three adjustments to Village C. Yes. But I, I don't know, but I, I, just, I, I just have an awful lot of trouble trying to explain why the taxpayers are having to pick up this $35 million that was supposed to have been done right the first time. And when you stand up there and say everything about that system is wrong, you know, that, that, that's just... <laughs> That's just hard to explain. Who defines substantial? Uh, who determines if it's substantial or not? The planning director. So Thirty-five million is substantial. <laughs> well, then we got that. <laughs> we got that. This is going along. But you just said so. It takes the thirteen point five to take care of the sections that are currently developed, and also that would do correct to get them to a level compliant with the hundred-year right flood. But it still allows. Because the pipe size doesn't drain fast enough, it still fills the streets. It just, at the 100-year, will ensure it doesn't get into the houses. So the delta, just to make sure that the balance part, the part that Barbara was talking about, is now the part you mentioned about tearing up the streets and so that the streets don't flood. I just want to make sure that we talk about a lot of things here, and sometimes the people listening can lose track of all the moving pieces, and I certainly was. Right. So I just want to make sure. So this keeps the homes from flooding. The balance is to keep the streets from flooding. The, I, I Most get, of the time. Yes, yes, sir. I get in trouble using nuisance ponding when people really are say it's flooding, but I would define as we get into that nuisance ponding at the 100-year flood. Okay, I got Above you. Above 100 years, all bets are off. Yep, got it. All right. Thank you. Any more questions on this one? Tony, are you going to throw something else up there for us? <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Okay, Baker Road Colbert and Ditch Improvements. This project is fully funded for a cost of $450,000. Uh, this project is being managed by the SGA office. Uh, the project includes culvert improvements under Baker Road and ditch improvements both upstream and downstream of that culvert. It's currently in the acquisition phase and construction is scheduled to begin this summer. Belby Manor Outfall Ditch. This project is fully funded and under construction. The construction includes bank stabilization along uh, 750 linear feet of outfall ditch. We expect to be completed with this project this summer. Central Resort District drainage improvements. Uh, the total project cost for this multi-phase project is $113 million. It currently has $300,000 appropriated to date. I have briefed council on this project previously and discussed the two interim projects that have been identified. Uh, the first one for an estimated cost of six million, and the second one for an estimated cost of fifteen million. Finally, observation on that, Ms. Mayor. I said it before. We'll talk about it during budget. But I think when you look at these bills that are coming, there, 
and I'll say it again, I'll be talking about it during budget, the stormwater management fee is not an effective solution to <coughs> finance the capital construction of these projects. <coughs> Citywide sea level rise and recurrent flooding analysis. This project is fully funded. Uh, the project is responsible for analyzing the four major watersheds located in the city and developing a response plan for each uh, watershed. Uh, we're currently in the public engagement phase. We have had a series of public presentations on this project uh, to the public uh, to acquaint the public with the study process, the initial results, and the path forward. Uh, we expect to begin presenting the adaptation strategies in the fall. Since we've got extra time now on this, uh, if everybody else has gone home, to, to, to speak to what it's John just for was you. saying, <laughs> the difference between stormwater and sea level rise. I guess, John, you were saying sea level rise should not be with the stormwater fee. I think Is there a way to separate those through this process? I would hope that things that are dealing with flood control versus water quality, which I think is stormwater management, I'm with you. I think this flooding, sea leveling is something, that, and I think we have to look to see what the results are. But I think we should be able to make a distinction between water quality issues and truly flood control caused by sea level rise. There is a big difference. Thoughts from Dave Hans? Uh, it's going to be, uh, uh, it's going to dwarf your $35 million Thing that's stuck in our throat, Miss Hanley. It's going to be huge, and everybody saw the paper today, um, and the and the new numbers and the new VIMS uh, prognosis. It's it's real, but we must be positive. We must be engaged. We must provide engineering solutions to to keep our 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 city council our, our city on a course of to to preserve its quality of life. Barbara. Okay to an extent, but I think I'm looking at this area, and this is the area that turns blue when they start talking about sea level rise. And I look at the number of projects that we have knocking at our door now wanting to develop. And somehow, I'm not so sure we've got to engineer, I guess it's possible to engineer anything, but I'm not so sure we need to engineer projects that we know are in areas that are susceptible to sea level rise, particularly within the next 50 years, which is not all that long. So I think there are going to have to be some, some, some major concerns. This is what I have problems with folks saying about Asheville Park. Well, how do we know it's going to work? And when we look at these areas that are very susceptible to flooding, and we keep developing them, and then we say, well, if it doesn't work, we'll just go back to the people and say, give us some more money. We've got to fix it again. <coughs> at, at some point, I think we can say engineering is not the answer. <laughs> that, you know, so somehow or in there, there's going to have to be some, some recognition that you know, everything maybe can be engineered, but that might not be the practical way to do it. And we really have to start thinking about the people who are going to buy these homes in these susceptible areas. And, you know, to, to keep building homes in areas where we know in all probability within the time frame of this study are going to be flooding. Maybe they're not flooding today, but by the time they get their mortgage paid, it, they will. <coughs> I mean, I think we've really got to, got to start looking at this thing in a different fashion. Well, to, to your point, I, communities already are experiencing what they call daytime flooding and it's not raining and uh well, we get that every spring give us two more months and we'll have it all over the place at the southern part of the city well the philosophy of berm pond and pump is designed to sectionalize to quadrant out if you will uh these areas uh not unlike other low-lying uh, areas that have developed um uh, and you're going to have to engineer. That's why we have 31 drainage areas in the city, and each one of them acts independently, and then they all flow to the waters of the United States. And, and so there will be areas, Ms. Henley, that uh, are in all likelihood, there's no affordable means by which we can, but, but we have to preserve certain elements, and, and we're in, we're, we're already in for a pound 
uh, in that transition area in the areas that we're talking about now. And abandonment is not a is not a course of action that we can have. And we think that this 11 to 13 million dollar well modeled and will work and will entertain and will survive sea level rise is a berm pond and pump. It's elaborate uh, and it's extensive. But it's going to have to be paid for by the taxpayers <coughs> from now on. And that's where I think that's, you know, we, we somehow or other, uh, you know, in, in the old days, if we really thought that the, okay, the developer was going to put in the stormwater system and it was going to work and the, but now we're finding out that that's not the way it's going to be and it's really going to be up to the public to continue paying this. I think we've got to be perfectly honest with people and, and that's, that's Barbara, I think. talking about raising their stormwater fees because I keep hearing from people that they've got about all they want yeah. as far as stormwater fees, especially on that commercial rate. I, I think that's a, a very wise point that Barbara makes. <laughs> and, you know, if you look at, Smart uh, young man. Uh, you know, in Hurricane Matthew, when we experienced our last flooding, which that's the last flooding we experienced in the city of Virginia Beach, was uh, in 2016, Hurricane Matthew, which was a, a record-breaking storm. Everybody would agree that. But uh, you had uh, a significant, much more significant flooding in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and in Raleigh, North Carolina, they have begun to look at, um, you know, what is the cost to fix this? Can we fix it? And is this something that the taxpayer is willing to take on? Now, in certain, you know, aspects uh, of the city, um, you know, uh, I think that uh, most people who have been around here a long time know that the further you get off the ridge, the lower the land gets. Um, and, and so I think that's where we're experiencing a lot of this flooding that I think that's the flooding that you're referring to, the daytime flooding. And that ridge ain't very wide. It's not very wide. Um, and, and I think that most people who have been around here for any time know that for a fact. Um, and so, you know, uh, John talks about something that I completely agree with all the time. You know, you have, uh, you know, what is the cost to mitigate the risk? And, you know, I think that that is a question that may need to be asked at some point. How much is the taxpayer willing to uh, raise the stormwater fee uh, to mitigate a risk that may not be mitigatable? Is well, that but there you, I think you just hit the nail on the head. Yeah. You know, some. And there are a lot of cases, and I think I've heard Dave say this, to be fair. There are a lot of cases that this is not going to be fixable, mm -hmm. and you can't even put a price on it. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess a lot of that's in your area, too. Mm -hmm. The answer to your question, I think, is the only, and I think the only answer, really, because I agree, I don't think you can raise the stormwater fee to cover the cost. So... You're really in a situation you to where you have to reprioritize where you spend your money. That's what you're going to have to Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Uh, and that's before. what they're doing in Last Raleigh, year. North Carolina right now, and it's obviously very controversial. Well, are they uh, pulling out of an area, for instance, that they're just saying we're not going to try to fix this? There's an area where they said, yes, in the uh, crab, crab tree, uh, I'll go back and look at the article, but yes, there's an area where they have essentially said it doesn't matter how much that, money we dump into it. That may be the other option. Yeah. There may be areas where you, you have to take that option. Mm -hmm. There may be areas where you reprioritize. That, that's, that's a hard conversation that, unfortunately, we may, at some point, if the newspaper article this morning was correct, uh, that we may have to have. But not right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, but to build, but we can't to... keep rezoning and allowing more houses to be but... built until we have that conversation. Yeah. Well, we need to model to make sure that we're incorporating sea level rise and that we have a high level of confidence, engineering confidence, that we can create a solution that will per be able to withstand sea level rise. And test that model. It's a fairly cali it's very calibrated. Every time it rains, they're calibrating to say, this is what the model says it should be. 
They go out, they check what the rain did, and they go, holy cow, we're getting close. Or we have to adapt the model, and, the, and it's calibrated, and we won't make decisions okay. on anything that is We're going to be out of here at 6. We've got 15 yes, more we minutes. We plan to be out of here. If Tony just Tony, aren't you charts? enjoying this? We, we like it every time you come right. visit with us. <laughs> <laughs> College Park Level Green Drainage Improvements. This project's fully funded at a cost of 500000 uh, this project will address strange inadequacies in these two subdivisions. Um, a preliminary design phase identified some pipe locations that require cleaning and inspection, and that work is going to begin in a couple months. Eastern Shore Drive Drainage Phase 1. This is a multi-phase project. Phase 1 sections 1 and 2 are funded in the current CIP. The total project cost exceeds $83 million for all of the phases, which leaves a balance to complete of $27.1 million. I was coming down in front of the fire station last night from bus minister, and we hadn't had that much snow or rain. And I'm telling you, I was in that left-hand lane heading east. I couldn't see for a number of seconds because of the water that came over my car that I was driving through. Mr. Weed, you need to fix that. Oh, unfortunately, it's on the That's wrong side side. of the bridge. That's in Bayside. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's in Lynn Haven, but it's after the budget, I'm certain that money may shift to the other part of Shore Drive. <laughs> <laughs> the tidal wave came and pushed it over. I thought it had shifted. I'm, telling you, so, <laughs> I'm just telling you, I'm not exaggerating what happened either. I was, I was blurred out for... Uh, what happened to you is, what happened to you is, the water comes through a pipe that uh, goes from landside into the ocean, and that push that came over the, the, the wind... Push that high tide up, and it backed it in. I, I bet it was a geyser coming out of the I, I, I knew at Westminster. I knew it was the tide. Way to slow the presentation Most down there, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Hey, Great job. go ahead, young <laughs> Tony. I'm sorry, no one's going to interrupt you. Sixty more slides. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. yeah, fourteen, thirteen and a half minutes. <laughs> Okay, we, we currently do have a, um, another project in the Cape Hemner Canal that's under design. It's a box culvert between Ebb Tide and West Great Neck Road. Um, this, these improvements are necessary to um, help the Shore Drive Phase 3 roadway project, which was going to be presented today. <laughs> and uh, we an anticipate advertising that box culvert um, this summer. Lake Bradford, Lake Chubb. Um, you are familiar with this project from my quarterly briefings. It's a compilation of projects to address flooding in three areas, Church Point, Hollis Road, and the Chubb Lake, Lake Bradford area. Um, we have estimated a total project cost of $32 million. This is a large area. Um, currently, this project receives $1.1 million <clears throat> per year, uh, which leaves a balance to complete of $24.4 million. We're currently working on the detailed engineering analysis to develop the program of flood control measures that are needed for these three areas. <clears throat> Neighborhood stormwater infrastructure improvements. This program receives $1.15 million per year. Um, this program addresses neighborhood stormwater infrastructure improvements that fall beyond the scope of routine maintenance and also projects that do not meet um, the criteria as a standalone CIP, which would be projects that are less than $250,000. Uh, new projects are added to the list each year based on reported flooding. We currently have two active projects in this program. Both are in the preliminary design phase. The first one is at 50th Street, and the second one is the um, pump station modification at Goodspeed Road. North Lake Holly Watershed. Um, you're very familiar with this project. It's been around quite a while. Four sections have been completed. Section 3 was broken into two phases to accommodate um, the funding the way it was allocated. Section 3A is under construction now, and Section 3B will go to construction in July of 2020. Um, Section 1C includes embankment improvements along North Lake Holly, and that's scheduled to begin construction in 2019. Um, I do want to report that we are currently showing this project as fully funded However, uh, with some preliminary estimates, we have Section 3B may need some additional funding in 2021. Sherwood Lakes Drainage Improvements. This project is fully funded at a total project cost of $3 million. Uh, the design is comp complete, and we expect to advertise for construction uh, this summer. South Lake Holly Watershed. This project is fully funded and under construction. Uh, three out of the four sections are complete. The four section, uh, the, the last section um, 
will be complete by the end of 2019. Southern Canal Lead Ditch and Culvert Improvements Project. Um, this project is for the design and construction of drainage improvements um, in the southern watersheds. Pleasant Ridge Road is the next project, and it's currently in the preliminary design stages. This program receives $300,000 per year. And you can see on the slide some of the projects we've completed under this program. Stormwater Master Planning Analysis and Inventory. This project, as you know, is updating the uh, city stormwater master plans. The project is totally funded, um, and I will give you an update on the schedule in my quarterly briefing in a couple weeks. And finally, Windsor Woods, Princess Anne Plaza, and the Lakes. All three of these projects are funded in the 15-year stormwater program. However, on this slide, I am showing a balance to complete because this is just showing the six-year CIP program. Um, we are currently in the first phase, which is um, doing the detailed engineering analysis. We expect to have that analysis complete this summer, and I will give you a lot more details on this project in a couple weeks. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Melanie. Melanie, we're glad to have you here. Thank you. I will try to talk quickly, keeping in mind the time that we have. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about water quality regulatory compliance. Uh, and basically, I just wanted to point out a quick few accomplishments for the past year. We created a, a comprehensive update to our MS4 program plan. We executed that uh, SWIFT agreement with HRSD. And we've also successfully completed an audit that we had with DEQ back in March. Um, that went well. So on to our CIPs. Well, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, surface Water Regulatory Compliance Program is used to fund our operational compliance activities for our stormwater permit. It has proposed FY19 funding of $2.4 million, and we were issued that new permit from DEQ in 2016 that required a lot of significant actions during the first year. So I was just highlighting a few of those actions we took, completing a stormwater management facility inspection and maintenance manual, a flotables reduction plan, our annual dry weather screening program, and also mapping of our outfalls in Lynn Haven River. Uh, additionally, we have some public education and outreach components to that permit for stormwater pollution awareness. So some of the initiatives we've completed are educational materials. We have an outreach plan now that kind of defines our activities over the next four years of our permit. And also we set up two contracts with both the Elizabeth River Project and Lynn Haven River Now. And those are to encourage residents to construct stormwater management facilities on their properties, like rain barrels and rain bar gardens that we've shown here. Uh, so it's like a cost participation kind of with them, and they've just gotten those underway last fall. The Stormwater Quality Enhancements Project has an FY19 funding of $2.9 million. This is really focused on doing a lot of the action plans that we need to address both Chesapeake Bay and our local TMDLs. The Bay TMDL is about 80% complete. Uh, it's a total project cost of 600000 and we have gotten our numbers calculated to where we are going to achieve our first 5% reductions with the first phase, and those will be done with a combination of the construction projects and with our street sweeping program. We plan to meet those future compliance uh, requirements for the next phases using that pollutant trading agreement with HRSD for the sustainable water initiative for tomorrow. Well, David, could you just tell us how much of your compliance comes from the street sweeping program? And how much more we would have got from street sweeping if we would have swept up out all the sand and salt off the road after the storm took place? The way that the credits work are based on the number of lane miles swept. So it wouldn't relate necessarily to that storm. The Mac. They're just giving you some kind of credit. They're, they're, they, yeah, they've Not updated the, case. correct. Okay, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. That was a real metric. They used to use that metric, but now they've changed that. We thought they were going to do that, but went through a real rigmarole with the, to get compliant because if we were going to spend the money that we're spending on street sweeping, we need TMDL credits, uh, yep. phosphorous, nitrogen, and sediment. I got you. Okay. All right. Let's, yes, sir. Let's move on. Next, we're about 60% complete with our local phosphorus action plan, and that is mostly focused in waterways in the southern rivers, so that's outside the Chesapeake Bay. We're also about 60% complete with our local bacteria action plan, and that has um, components throughout the whole city. So many of our waterways are impaired for bacteria. Stormwater quality enhancements. 
Uh, this basically is another permit requirement that requires the city to invest in annual surface water quality monitoring program at about 150000 a year. It includes removal effectiveness for stormwater management facilities and also monitoring pollutants that run off two small watersheds. And it's accomplished through our regional partnership with uh, HRPDC. We have two active water quality monitoring projects. One is for the Lake James watershed. We're doing some monitoring to help identify the primary sources of pollutants in that watershed to guide development of some effective response actions that we can take. And we're also performing monitoring at City View Park Pond, and that's going to be used to support our future comprehensive stormwater management plan development. It's all about Centerville. Stormwater quality enhancements. This project is underway to address um, TMDL pollutant reduction requirements uh, for treatment from roadways. We've identified and analyzed about 112 projects over this past year, so we've been busy trying to find some projects citywide. And this is just a figure of an example project that we've analyzed. It also has calculations and conceptual cost estimates that go along with it. And from these, we've initiated preliminary design for about 22 projects, and some of those I'll talk quickly about. Elizabeth River Implementation Plan. This is the Kemp's Lake project, total project cost of $5.6 million. Uh, it's going to construct wetlands, pretreatment areas, or four bays, and we'll add aeration, which is all going to remove the pollutant capability of the facility. It was awarded grant funding by DEQ of one, about $1.2 million. It's 95% complete, and construction may begin this fall. Chatham Hall Lake project, uh, total project cost $2 million. Uh, it would be similar to Kemp's Lake. And it was also similarly awarded grant funding from DEQ for $750,000. Uh, design's about 10% complete and construction planned for fall 2019. Uh, again, in the Elizabeth River TMDL, our last project on this one is the Price Street Cost Participation Project. It's going to be used to meet our stormwater requirements for the development of both the new apartments and also treat the existing industrial and residential impervious area. Uh, the city portion of the project is $2.9 million. And we are going to be using this towards our Chesapeake Bay TMDL compliance. Construction is expected to begin early this summer. Lynn Haven River Watershed has a total FY19 funding of $1.8 million, uh, and it also is focused on project improvements. New project is Bayville Lake. We're going to be doing a similar retrofit to Chatham and Kemp's Lake, and we would be using this for compliance with our local bacteria TMDL. The project has a unique opportunity since it's located at Bayville Park. It's one of Parks and Recreation's three dog parks, so we're going to take advantage of that for some public education. On to Southern Rivers, getting close. Uh, this project has FY19 funding of 400000 and includes projects, again, focused on those phosphorus and bacteria TMDLs that I mentioned. Uh, along General Booth Boulevard, we've identified a project to construct two stormwater facilities. One is at uh, Dam Neck Station Road, and the other one is at London Bridge Road. They're both shown in the green dots on the map. Total project cost of those two facilities would be 570000 And the next project is located at Indian River Road and Lynn Haven Parkway with a cost of about 260000 this is going to street stormwater runoff again from any river road, and it's going to address both our local phosphorus and bacteria TMDL. Uh, it's likely going to be a type of manufactured stormwater treatment at this location. And I'd like to go ahead and just turn it over to Mark Jones to talk about the operations and maintenance side. Thank you for your time. Or, glad to have, thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Vice Mayor, Mayor, Member of City Council, City Manager, thank you. Um, <clears throat> stormwater operations is tasked with maintaining all of the drainage systems to maximize their lifespan and effectiveness. We use six CIPs, totaling about 15 million a year to accomplish this. <clears throat> CIP 7416, this CIP is used for stormwater pipeline, re pipeline rehabilitations, upgrades and related items. Under this, we do typical neighborhood rehabilitation projects. The entire drainage system in the area is cleaned, videotaped, and then repaired. We recently completed Green Run, Glenwood, Pine Ridge, and Kings Grant. We are nearing completion of Magic Hollow, Fairfield, Lansdowne Lakes, Lynn Haven Woods are underway to be completed. The CIP also funds corrugated steel pipe, CCTV and slip lining, contractor repair cave-ins, smaller scale drainage projects. CIP 7415, canal management or lake management. The CIP is used for lake dredging and associated lake maintenance. Before this CIP was added, it was projected the lakes were on a 950-year dredging cycle. 
The CIP has brought the cycle time down to 95 years. We have dredged 13 lakes thus far under the CIP, utilizing existing funds. Public Work maintains a prioritized list after the year 2026 that includes the top 50 lakes that need dredging. A new CIP for the canal program has been submitted for adoption in FY19 to assist with maintaining the 95-year cycle time. We're also seeing more dam and outfall maintenance needs, which has, which has a potential impact on current cycle times for the lake dredging. CIP 7023, infrastructure improvements. The CIP is the one we use to supplement the activities of our in-house ditch crews via contracts to maintain the off-road ditches in the city. This year, we're working in zones A in the north, I in the south, along with doing several ditches from previous years that were not completed. Currently, we're in a 12-year cycle, down from the original 16-year cycle, but not at our goal of eight years yet. 7412, stormwater pump station modifications. As you can see, the CIP does the major maintenance projects in our 15 stormwater pump stations. We're currently working through a rehabilitation program that will ultimately overhaul each of the stations. Current funding level will only do an average of one station per year, requiring 15 years to complete. 7411, um, facilities maintenance CIP maintains the oceanfront's flood control projects. This is the largest flood control project in the city. We have the commitment to the Corps of Engineers to maintain their structure. The annual inspections by the Corps have noted issues requiring substantial maintenance by the city. Stair nosing replacements are currently in progress. 7026, cost participation. The CIP funds are cost participation programs for both roadside piping and lake vegetation control. Allows for us to do a 50-50 one-time cost share with the citizens to either pipe their roadside ditches or treat their lake for nuisance vegetation. Since we added the lake vegetation portion this year, we've seen citizen interest skyrocket over 600 lakes, and the city would be eligible for this program. The current average cost for each one-time lake treatment averages 1,000 to 10,000 per lake. Six lake treatments have been completed thus far. Do First they, above target request. Does the community have to apply for their lake, or do they? How are you? Yes, ma'am. Each uh, home association applies. Uh, we've worked out a deal with the city attorney's office for an 80% agreement. They pay their 50%. We arrange the uh, contractor to go out and treat the lake. Check goes back to the CIP. Refunds uh, that 50% to cost participate for the next. Mr. Jones. Yes, sir. How do the communities know that they are that they need to apply? How do they know? Yeah. Well, we is somebody going to inform them or what? What's well, we are working on public uh, notification. We've recently completed a flyer on um, working with water quality um, to post uh, brochures, uh, public meetings. Um, public, a lot of public inquiry, and a lot of times, sir, we get uh, cross hopping between communities. So, like Lake Tran will hear about it, Great Neck will hear about it because they live right <laughs> next door, and so forth. And so we get um, voice of the resident as well. Jim um, Wood had a question. Yeah, it was following on what, what Lewis was talking about because in this program, correct me if I'm wrong, you can only do it one time, and and so that's that's an issue for some of these, these communities that they, they gather up their funds and, and Tom and I went to one um, about a year ago I guess now where where the, the folks did one and it worked okay for a little while but then the weeds and everything came back and that, that's kind of what I was talking about at the retreat talking about the um, a, a potential of using the SSD model so so that neighborhoods can can actually maintain their own lakes whether or not it's just it's just strictly the treating or if, if they want to dredge it for aesthetic purposes as opposed to stormwater purposes because those two things conflict. You know, the, from the city's perspective, we just want it to, to take the water. The, the, the homeowners want, want to be able to, to boat and fish on the lake. So i I, I just like us to, I don't know who's working on that, but Mr. Manager, I'd like us to to, to maybe maybe look at that now because when you're, you're at a 90-year cycle, that, that's, that's not, not the best. I realize it's much better than it was, but it's still, it's still not good. Okay. Yes, sir. Let's go ahead. Yes, sir. The first above target request would provide a program for canal dredging, shoreline stabilization, and related maintenance of canals. Over the years, the canal <laughs> systems in our neighborhoods, bless you, the neighborhoods have silted in overall. This is not a flooding issue, but has become an area of concern within the neighborhoods, generating many complaints. This program would clean approximately 47 miles of canals in a 25-year cycle. Second, this deserves some talk about priority versus the payoff 
from getting all that silt left because all Princeton Plaza had only a foot left of clearance when we're looking at projects. Which projects give us the best return for protection for the most people? Is it a new capital project or a lot of canal dredging? I hope during the budget process we can talk about those trades. Yes, sir. The absolutely. Yes, sir. Second above target. Yeah, uh, second above target request as uh, the second new CIP suggested by operations. This would provide a one-time funding for FY19 to make essential repairs to the 48-inch outfall pipes that discharge from the stormwater pump station at 42nd Street. This pump station is currently in a modified operating condition, and the south middle pipe can only be operated during significant weather events and routine maintenance. <laughs> Detailed inspection of the south middle pipe is scheduled for March 2018. The last above target request, Pinewood Road, stormwater drainage improvements, um, is a one-time $1 million for FY19. It's the third new CIP suggested by operations. This would provide uh, essential repairs to the roadway in Colbert under Pinewood Road near Little Neck Creek. Multiple cave-ins have occurred at this section of Pinewood Road. Field investigation and analysis was conducted in 28 July 2017 and recommended replacement of the culvert. In closing, um, in the simplest of terms, we've solved most of the easy stormwater problems and are now trying to address the more complex and expensive issues. Uh, the new water quality regulations are demanding, um, are more demanding, and our existing infrastructure is aging. Um, all these issues are increasing the operating management requirements and demands. <coughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. Yes, sir. And we appreciate it. Any other things to go on here, folks? Yes, Thanks for yes, sir. your attendance. We'll see you all later.